Good morning, everybody, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear guests, friends, and colleagues. It is a great joy and honor for me to welcome you to our side event on 25th of May, 2023, at the 32nd Commission on Crime Prevention and, and Criminal Justice at the Vienna United Nations building. My name is Maria Riel. I am director of Women's Federation for World Peace International Office at the Vienna uh, Center. Today's topic is healing or strengthening family relationship is healing society and reducing vulnerability of young people towards crime and, and hopelessness. We could invite also very good partners from the United Nations Department of Drug and Crime. This is the project Family United, the skill programs for the families and also other NGOs as uh, Father Con founded 2018 to address the link between fathers and human trafficking and parents workshop and Austrian uh, non-profit organization serving children, parents, and educators with focus on non-judgmental communication and respectful way of treating each other. We as Women's Federation for World Peace International are working for peace and reconciliation. We started with bridges of peace between former enemy countries. Now we continue with education programs, with strengthening women and families, especially fathers and relationship between husband and wife to protect our families and to make us clear, uh, to, to, not, to help everybody to find the unique value in themselves and learn to serve the society and enjoy the life on this earth. I am happy to introduce our moderator for today, Mrs. Kyung In van den Van den Well, <laughs> Oliviera. She was born and raised in Netherlands. She worked for decades with Women's Federation as young representative in Netherlands. Then she she united with us. She joined us 2021 at the United Nations office in Vienna, and now she is working with unaccompanied young people from different countries to is as a guardian to find the place for them in the foreign country and to guide them to solve their situation and to find foster parents or many other things. So the floor is yours. And okay. thank you for coming from Netherlands and join us also for this event of today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rio, for this beautiful introduction. And uh, we would like to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us this very early morning. We're very happy and honored that you're all here here in the room in Vienna, but also online. Welcome, dear friends and um, uh, relations. So uh, like Maria has mentioned, our topic for today is healing family relationships is healing society and reducing vulnerability of young people. So we're definitely on the prevention side. This is also uh, always one of our points that we want to stress. If you prevent, then you don't have to solve. So welcome everyone. And I'm very happy to present the first speaker of our panel today, uh, Mrs. Veronica Lippert. Um, she is from the Elton Werkstatt, longtime friends of the Women's Federation. And she will be speaking on the topic, when parents are doing well, children are doing well. So uh, Mrs. Lippert, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I just say yeah. that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming so early. Um, I want to say thank you for you, your for interest and participation for this topic. For us, the parent workshop and me, 
it's a very great honor to have the possibility to speak here because it's a very essential topic that parents have the understanding and the possibility, good morning, <laughs> um, to educate their children well. The Elternwerkstatt, the parent workshop, an association serving children, parents, and pedagogues, was founded in 1999 by Maria Neuberger Schmitz. She's sitting over there, and Michaela Hara, and is a private, impartial, and non denominational non profit association. We are based on the values of humanistic psychology non-violence and respect for the dignity and individuality of every human being. The Parents' Workshop is a place um, of parent education. It is an initiative that helps parents to strengthen their skills and knowledge in the upbringing of their children. Our goal is to give parents the tools and understanding to support their children in the best possible way and promote positive development. In the parents' workshop, we offer a variety of workshops, seminars, lectures, and information events on different topics and parent education. Our experienced and qualified trainees share the knowledge and experience with parents in order to strengthen them in their roles of educators. The topics covered in the parents' workshop are wide ranging. We offer courses in promoting the emotional development of children, conflict resolutions, communication in the family, media education, and much more. We understand that every family is unique and has different needs. It is therefore important for us to offer a wide ranging, come in, welcome. <laughs> it is therefore important for us to offer a wide range of service tailored to the individual challenges and interests to parents. In addition to the workshops and seminars, we also offer regular meetings and exchange groups where parents have the opportunity to exchange ideas with other parents, share experience and learn more from each other. This exchange between like-minded people is often very valuable and can help to strengthen the trust and network of parents. The parent workshop attaches great importance to a respect respectful and supported atmosphere. We want to offer parents a space where they feel comfortable and understood and where they can ask questions and address challenges which, without shyness. We believe that a positive parent-child relationship is based on understanding, appreciation and communication and work to convey the values in our offerings. Parent education is an important part of the work of court and youth welfare office. Both courts and youth welfare office recognize, recognize the importance of qualified parental education to support parents in fulfilling their parental responsibilities to ensure the best interest of the child. Courts may order participation in parental education programs in certain cases, such as custody disputes or family court proceedings. This is done to give parents the opportunity to improve the parenting skills, resolve conflicts, communicate appropriately, and keep their children well-being in mind. Youth Welfare Office also play an important role in part of parent education. They often um, offer their own parental education programs or refer parents to external providers. 
This program can support parents in a variety of areas such as promoting child development, dealing with challenging behaviors, strengthening parent-child bonding, teaching parenting techniques, and give them tools and much more. Therefore, we work very networked manner with those two institutions. Parent education and violence prevention go hand in hand as both aim to help parents create a positive and non-violent environment for their children. Through targeting parental education, parents can lean the necessary skills to resolve conflict without violence, to educate their children, and to build a healthy parent-child relationship. Here are some aspects of parent education that can contribute to violence prevention. A very, very, very important part is nonviolent communication, stress management in the family, positive discipline, binding and relationship, and violence prevention strategies. For about three years, we have also been building up the area of intercultural work with parents. Intercultural burned parent education is very essential. It plays a quick critical role in the supporting parents from different cultures, backgrounds, in the upbringing of their children. Here are some reasons why intercultural parent is important. It's very important that we, the society, are sensitive because of the backgrounds of the different parents and their countries and culture. Communication and cooperation, resources and support, inclusion and diversity, equal opportunities. Therefore, we trained um, trainees for in about 10 different languages. And we have a very culture resource of parents at the Elternwerkstatt. Our motto in the parent workshop is if we parent or if we parent are fine, our children are fine. Thank you very much in this early morning for your support and your efforts. And I'm happy that we can share the knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Lippert, for your beautiful contribution and the work the Elton Werkstatt is doing in Austria. Mm -hmm. And great that you also have so many languages and this sensitivity for this intercultural aspects because a lot of things go wrong there as well. Right. I know too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. So uh, next I'm honored to welcome our next speaker of, of our panel, uh, Mr. Patrick Erlinson, all the way from uh, the United States, Los Ange Angeles, welcome. <laughs> We're very happy to have you. Uh, he's the founder of See It Ended Film and Arts Festival for Human Trafficking Awareness, and also the founder of FatherCon. <laughs> and he will be here speaking about the work of FatherCon and uh, on the topic, the role of fathers in shaping the future of their children. <coughs> Mr. Erlinson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, this is actually my first time in Europe, and I'm so grateful that it's for such an event as this. So, <laughs> and for all of you coming so early. Um, uh, I, I wanted to begin with a, a quote. Uh, this is from the UNICEF Chief of Early Childhood Development, Dr. Pia Brito. Um, he said, more than just a second parent or an extra set of hands, fathers are one of the best child development resources we have. And if we're going to give children the best start in life, we all need to fully recognize and utilize this role. And I think that this is, this is extremely important that we see the, the unique contribution that fathers make to early child development. I think since the early, since the 1960s, we've had kind of a downplaying of the significant role that a father plays. But now we have over 50 years of research that's, that's contradicting that that image that the father doesn't play such a critical role, especially in early, early childhood development. Um, if we can put the slides up.
I like this this picture just because it kind of it captures the children learn through imitation. They 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 follow much more what they see than um, than what they hear. And also, um, in Victor Frankl's book *Man's Search for Meaning*. I think children are constantly creating meaning out of their experience, how they're treated, the experiences they have with their parents and with the environment around them. They're assigning meaning to it, but with a very with an undeveloped experience in life. And parents need to really understand that, that the way that we interact with our children, our children are, are coming to the conclusion of what that means. And I think especially that's important for fathers to recognize. Um, my, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so I first learned about human trafficking about 12, 13 years ago when I was working with um, USA for UNHCR um, in Los Angeles. And it was actually the, the trafficking and organs of refugees fleeing from South Sudan and crossing into Egypt. Um, and it, there was just something about that, the betrayal of children just kind of slammed into my heart. So I started working with the uh, Long Beach Human Trafficking Task Force um, in Los Angeles. And I'll never forget one experience of just sitting down with a, a, a young woman who had survived her experience being trafficked. And what she said was she was she was 11 years old and at home her mother had a had a boyfriend over and she was she was playing with her dolls in her bedroom and this man came into the room sat down on the bed next to her and began to touch her and the the sheer panic and and freezing of this poor young girl not knowing what to expect not knowing what's going to happen and then her mother coming in the doorway and looking at what was happening and then closing the door and walking out. And the way this girl explained it, she, all of her hope was there. Her mother was there. Her mother was going to save her. And, and instead her mother basically gave her over to this man. And so she, right after that, she ran away from home and that's how she ended up being trafficked. And there's so many things that are happening to, to children in their homes that are leading them to be trafficked. Um, when I, I started uh, men Standing Against Trafficking is one of our first awareness projects to get men involved because what was happening, if you attended any conference for human trafficking um, about 10 years ago, it was 98% women and then there were maybe two or three men that were there. But this is a this is a problem. The sex trafficking of, of children and the sex trafficking of vulnerable people is really driven by men. Um, the demand side of the equation is male. And so we you know, that my feeling was we had to start to incorporate men into this, into this effort to, to stop human trafficking. So men standing against trafficking, we would, we would stand on a street corner, which was part of a track or the blade where girls were being sold. And our main, our main intention in doing that was we wanted to, we wanted to inspire the girls that, that not all men were customers. If you talk to survivors of sex trafficking, every single man is a potential customer in, in their mind, in their heart. And we wanted to contradict that and show that not all men were customers. Um, we also wanted to send a message to the traffickers that we see them, that that we acknowledge that they're there and please stop. <laughs> and also to the men who are coming to buy, that, that we wanted to give them a chance to, to disrupt their intention so that they may turn around and go home to their wives and kids. The one experience that I had while I was standing on the street corner, we would do this demonstration outside of a hotel where a, a young woman was killed by her trafficker. She didn't make him enough money. And um, so he did her away. Um, but one of the experiences I had, we were out there with the signs and this man comes just peeling into the parking lot, gets out of his car, comes up. And I don't know what to expect. Tears in his eyes. And he said, I did everything I could for my family. I, I worked two jobs. I saved money. I bought a house here in this neighborhood thinking this was gonna be a safe place for, for my kids to grow up. And he said, every day my 12 year old daughter on her way to school is being approached by men wanting to pay her for sex. And she's terrified to go to school every single day. And I, this, this is experience of so many people and so many fathers that, that have tried to do the right thing for their children um, and then had it turned into something quite ugly. And he was just, he was just in tears over this and these are the things that kind of really motivate me to kind of how do we find solutions to this um in in a different way it's something that that we haven't tried already um so several of the things that are really impacting families today i think we look at, at poverty violence 
and education. These are three things that are, that are impacting our families and our communities today to a great extent. And so looking at that, there's a father component to each one of these things and much more. I mean, this is, a, this is definitely not a complete list. This is a, very, this is a short list of the things that are impacting our families today. But there's a father component to these, so that's why I wanted to mention them. Um, I think one of the biggest drivers now for how fathers are being derailed and the problems that we are having in our homes relates, relates to a sense of entitlement. This is being driven by um, political messaging, advertising, um, social media, this, this constant sense of discontent that, we're, that we don't have what we should have. I'm entitled to something more. And... And that leads to a, a focus on what I don't have and a lack of gratitude for what I do have. And, and that fuels this sense of victimization and it drives us to, to blame others or that, that there's somebody responsible. Somebody's keeping me from something that I should have. And I think one of the, one of the main problems with this is the ubiquitous 24 seven access now that we all have to pornography. And pornography is, has transformed our, our relations, our, our view of ourselves, but also how we see other human beings. And it's, and it's especially when you consider the hardcore nature of pornography today, which is easily accessed by children, eight-year-olds are seeing images of daughters having sex with their fathers and brothers and sisters having sex with each other. And this is coming from the adult world. So again, we have children like assigning meaning to what they're experiencing. And their conclusion is that these things are somehow normal and and so we have eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds that are now looking at their sister i, I think in the uk there was reported a 400 percent increase in child on child sexual assaults where children are acting out what they're seeing in pornography um, and it's also the derailing component for fathers we have we have we have men that are engaging with pornography it, it decreases their sense of of moral authority over their families over their children and it's disrupting something in America. It's about 500,000 divorces a year. They're now related to, to especially men, but increasingly women's um, viewing pornography and becoming addicted to the extreme content there. Um, this, this top image, I chose this. This is an advertisement. Can you guess what that advertisement is for? That's what you'd think, right? It's a watch advertisement. Um, and this is this is the more calm version of their ad campaign um but this kind of messaging is all around us i should have this kind of you know you, you know you look at this it's like i should have this kind of life you know i should have this kind of experience um but this growing sense of entitlement i think is driving the discontent that's that's making men that's making fathers that's making individuals kind of search for something more in their life this feeling that i should have faster internet i should have perfect hair i should have whatever it is but it's this constant messaging of entitlement. Um, this, this leads also now to an increase in the sexual abuse of, of boys. Uh, of course, many more girls are, are sexually abused than boys. But the reason I'd focus on this is because it, it's, it's considered now about one out of six boys are being sexually abused um, as children. And according to Interpol, the abuse of younger boys is much more extreme than the abuse of the girls face. It's it's much more violent, and it's it's the the sexual abuse of of young boys is so disruptive to their their natural development as a human being and how they see other human other human beings and how they treat others and how they see themselves. Um, one man that I worked with on that men standing against trafficking one day he he came and he just told me I got to tell you you know about me we've been working together for three years, and he had been repeatedly raped by his older brother when he was very young. And every decision, major decision in his life was then somehow connected to that experience. He joined the Marines, anything to show that he was a man, that he, he had to kind of overcome that experience that he had had. Um, and this is, this is the, the sexual abuse of boys is what's being carried into our relationships as husbands and also into our parenting. And I think this, this idea that we are, we are now encouraging this idea that sex is entertainment is even expanding that, where there's even more kind of seeing children as sex objects. Um, and you see that kind of rising in the world today. Um, single parent homes, we have um, globally, according to the UN Women's Association, 101.3 million 
um, single mother homes globally. Um, and this is, um, you know, when you bring this up, a lot of people then start to cringe and start to feel like you're going to disparage these hardworking single mothers. Not at all. But it's it's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that a father brings to children that that a mother can't. And they're there. You look at the data from 50 years and the importance and significance of fathers and how they raise their children and the interaction with the children is incredibly important. And to have so this means if there's 101 million single mothers, that means we have about 300 million or more children being raised in single single mother homes um, with the, the, all the consequences of what they're missing out in not having a not having a father's influence and love. Okay. Click. <laughs> I just love technology. It's so great when it actually works. Oh. Oh, 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 there we go. Okay, and so another aspect of this, I think as, as more men become derailed from their experience as fathers, finding purpose in life, finding you know, their, their joy and actually interacting with their children and seeing their children grow up into thriving human beings, we're seeing this rise in, in suicide rates among men. Um, that I think so many so many men have been conned, which is one of the reasons I named my organization Father Con. We have men that are being deceived into thinking that they're going to be happier for you know thirty minutes in the backseat of a car with a twelve year old than they are taking care of their their wife and their and their own children. And so then they're coming to a point, and they're you know fifty, they've been divorced, their kids hate them. Um, their their life experiences become so vapid and void of significance and meaning. That, that we have an increasing number of men committing suicide. In the UK today, the number one cause of death of men is suicide. And the thing that really horrified me was to look at this figure and you see the increase in suicide of 10 to 14 year olds. The 10 year olds are deciding that they have nothing to live for. We're creating an environment where, where children are not finding the, a joy in being children and are not finding a purpose to, to live for. But I know to me, that's just an alarming figure that we have 10 year olds deciding that life's not worth living. Um, this growing sense of purposelessness, I think among men, as, as more focus has been placed on women's empowerment and, and educating girls, which is a, a, an important and valuable thing. This is, and it's a must, it's something that must happen. But what's happening is, is a sidelining of boys and men. And there's a growing sense of, of having no purpose. We don't need to be the breadwinners anymore. We're not even necessary for having children. We're, we're, we don't need to be warriors. There's, there's this growing sense of, I have no place. And so we have a growing number of boys that are, that are feeling I have I have no purpose and no function. And that's led to kind of globally, but in the United States, you look at this, 7 million men that have basically checked out. And that's uh, there's complicated reasons for that. We have also very high incarceration rates. Um, but there's a the the number of the number of men that have checked out of the workforce. They're not even bothering to look for work. They're just staying home. You can live your life on the internet. Um, is is a terrifying consequence of, of where we're at today. So whether it's actual physical suicide or whether it's, you know, a, a, a kind of a withdrawal from society, um, this is what we're seeing kind of in a growing number of men. I'm sorry, I'm having to race through so much. Um, so the, the, these are just some of the consequences of absent and distractive abuses, abusive fathers. Um, poverty, four times more likely to, for poverty, aggressive behavior and violence, um, two times higher for boys. Um, the um, Emotional back, um, yeah. So the emotional behavioral problems. Th this is one that's really concerning: is that the boys are dropping out of school at really high rates, and men are not finishing. If they go to college, they don't finish; they don't graduate. Um, and so this is also kind of leading to a withdrawal. It's also leading to criminal activity and behavior that that leaves them going to prison. So we have like you're five times more likely to go to prison if you grow up without a father in the home. Um, so these are all things that I wanted to address through. Um, through FatherCon, how can we um, change this dynamic? So one of the things that, that I've learned through all of this research is that empathy is actually learned more from the father than from the mother, which is kind of a counterintuitive. But the way that fathers play with their children is what actually communicates that, that, a, that you as a child, that we have to consider the feelings of others and, the, and be aware of our impact on others. 
Um, this was a 26-year longitudinal study that concluded this, that fathers were ab you know, absolutely critical in children learning empathy. Um, so if you then you consider that there's 300 million children that are growing up without a father, are they, are they not developing kind of their full sense of empathy that they would be if they, if they had a father in the home? Um, also literacy rates, when fathers read to children, children retain about 15 to 20% more language. So their, their language skills grow, their relationship with a written word develops and, and they stay in school. So a father just takes a little bit of time and reads to his children. There's a huge impact for that child and how they develop. Um, we, have, we have two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. So anyway, father con, so we really try to, to in, there are, our three objectives are really to inform. We wanna get information to fathers, things like about reading. We wanna to, want to tell them how they can have this relationship with their children that's valuable and impactful and they can change the whole course of life of their children. We, we give a Heart of the Father Award because we want to inspire fathers about it. We so, so often we, we lose our significance as fathers. So we want to change that by giving a Heart of the Father Award. We recognize people that are going above and beyond, even you know, for their own children, but also for the world around them and their communities. Uh, we provide tremendous like, topics of training that are important to fathers um, that they can educate and grow personally. The other, the other thing that's very important is connecting them to resources. So we collaborate with all the other organizations um, that are providing um, therapy. We, we need men to heal. You know, if they've been sexually abused, they need, to, they need to heal. So we need to connect them to resources that are going to change them. Another thing that I feel really important is, is fathers really need to understand that they have to be trustworthy in order to their, for their children to trust them, which is actually the thing that's going to prevent them from being trafficked more than anything else. If they can trust their father, trust their parents, um, that's going to prevent, prevent them being exploited um, and the ease with which they're exploited. Human traffickers today say they don't even have to groom kids. Kids are coming out of our homes ready to be exploited, um, which is tragic. And also, if we start raising boys to aspire to being fathers, if that becomes part of our education of boys, that, they, that they're looking forward to the day that they're going to be a father, so they change how they behave in order to prepare for that day that they're going to be parents. Um, and that's what I'm going to leave you with, because I'm out of time. Um, anyway, this is so much hope for us. If we can really inspire fathers, we can change how our children are growing up, and we can decrease human trafficking, yay. Thank you so much, Mr. Erickson. Thank you so much. Due to time, I will leave it there. Thank you for presenting you. Father Khan and coming from the U.S. Um, so we will go to our next speaker. We're very honored to have Mr. Wadi Malouf here with us uh, of Family United from the UNODC, also a Universal Family Skills Program for uh, focus on prevention. So Mr. Malouf, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. And I also would like to thank the Women's Federation of uh, World Peace uh, for organizing this event and highlighting this very important social institution and the work moving forward and having a healthy sort of mix of fathers and uh, mothers talking about this important topic. So um, as you know, DC, if I can may have the clicker, it would be easier for the slides. Um, as you know, DC, I coordinate the global program on prevention um, but I have to mention a bit of a context um, because we're the Office on Drugs and Crime. We have two parliaments of member states. Um, my work is more on the health side, um, on healthy and safe development of, of youth. So more on the drug response, health response to drugs, but also I will mention how the family is linked also to the drug response under the Crime Commission Parliament that is meeting in this occasion now. Um, so in a general context, probably it will also bring uh, whatever um, uh, Mr. Aronson and uh, Ms. Lippert put in context, just showcasing the vulnerability um, of that we are addressing. If the slides move forward, they're not. Um, I don't know if there's a way to move. So generally speaking, I can start speaking until the slide shows up. Um, there is a certain vulnerability. Uh, whenever we talk about using drugs, especially among children and young adolescents, exactly, um, then there needs to be a certain culture of how to address the problem. 
it's not like there's a problem and I tackle the problem. There is something beyond the problem that any policymaker need to account for whenever there's a response that needs to be put in place to prevent in this situation. This is the vulnerability matrix that is linked to um, either building resilience or increased vulnerability, depending how you see it, on uh, crime and violence, where you will see there are things that we address on the individual level. There's something on uh, understanding the normative context that the child is in, but also you see family relationship is a core component, but the family is not a family in, in, in vacuum. The family is influenced by factors that go beyond the family per se. So that's from a crime perspective. But also, if we go from a drug perspective on the next slide, we do also have a similar problem and a similar problem to address in the sense of using drugs, especially among children and um, uh, and, and young adults, is not the result of a free independent choice because we see a lot of campaigns of just say no to drugs. Or um, the, this is the list of health consequences of drugs. That's just like touching the surface. There are personal characteristics, reactivity to stress, mental health, cognitive, be, uh, cognitive abilities um, that exist in a, in a child that needs to be addressed before the child have the ability to say no, but also there are structures around the child that either support or make it that, that resistance more difficult. Family is a core social institution. Of course, schools and peers and, and, and are important, but family is a social institution where a member of that social institution carry similar genes, similar history, and a future together. So basically, they, they're a different momentum than a teacher with students that have a transactional relationship which is important, the school is still important. But all of these institutions also exist in a larger vacuum. I mean, a larger setting, um, a family that's raising their children in the context of conflict, displacement, uh, war, uh, social inequalities, would have a different set of skills and tools to deal with their children than a family in, in normal circumstances. And all of these need to be accounted for. So these ecological layer of safety are important moving forward. Sorry for a bit of lag, but... Um, Great. So basically we do have, um, and, and what is important is like, yes, we have to work with the families. Yes, we have to give them these skills, but not everything that is called um, prevention and support is prevention and support because it has to be based on science. And there is science of how to support these skills moving forward. Um, and and, and as, a, as a mean of context is, of course, you know, not a single when you want to drive a car, you get a driver's license, you need to go through a test, but to be a parent, you just learn as you go. But there are skills that can be developed moving forward. I'll try to move as fast as I can. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I will not go into the, how we're moving with the culture of prevention, but I will highlight one essential point that is key in all of these messages, um, that substance use, for example, much like any other risky behavior, is um, a result of, um, there's a brain in the context of social development. So there's a socialization of the brain that goes from birth onward. And how the brain interacts with the social environment is key. So that brain internally has its own capacity in terms of moving forward and learning from the society. But the society has a role in terms of shaping, shaping how that brain moves forward. And that's an important key issue. So we have to accompany that brain from development onward in every single age of development to help that milestone of development that is essential from infancy to early, to middle, to early childhood, to middle childhood, to adolescent, to really move forward in an appropriate way. And every age of development requires certain skills. And need, needless to say that the family in that context is a key institution that really supports these milestones of development. Um, and, and when we talk about, when we address, and 90% of the inter interventions that are in the prevention standards do not talk about drugs, but talk about how to build skills around the child to help the child grow in a healthy and safe way. And that's the importance and value of family skills. And one proof that it is a developmental issue and it's not the drug information issue is that regardless of, you know, I didn't put a name of a country there, 99% of the time, when you ask them, what are the age of initiation of drug use in your country, regardless of the drug that you're talking about, it's between a window of time between 12 and 18 years of, of age, 21. And if it doesn't happen within this window of time, 
the probability of it happening at a later age is close to zero, which means that there is something about the brain development at this age of development that needs to be addressed. It, if it was a free choice, we would have made that free choice at any age after 12. There is no need to peak at this, within this age and not. So this is an important, the, the development is key. Um, and that's an important message to, to highlight. So conscious of the time, I will move forward just to highlight because there are lots of things that are important. But you know, you see the family in that context is important. The color scheme highlights that the green meaning a universal. So any family can benefit from these programs, but the yellow sign in the, you know, indicates that these are selective interventions of prevention, meaning that there's for a population that are higher risk than the normal population. So generally speaking, uh, parenting and family skills are this, have the strongest evidence of promoting a positive trajectory of uh, growth of children. Uh, it prevents several outcomes, um, mental health difficulties, substance use, crime, violence, violence against children, maltreatment, parental maltreatment, and they have global significance. That's why, as you know, DC, we have a core interest in terms of focusing on this institution. But we are not working in terms of making the parents uh, or the family becoming um, law enforcement officers within the family to control drug use or violence and crime. But we're really giving the skills of how to have warmth, effective praise, listening, assertive. These are the skills that are needed and that need to be adapted in different ages of development. These are skills that not all parents have the capacity to do and need support to see how they can articulate them in a positive way. Lots of political declarations mention the fact of the importance of focusing on families. I'm not going to go into their details. So the home is the most important influencing social institution in the life of the children. And its effects are longstanding. And you can see that our, the effect goes from bad parenting. I mean, go from negative to severely negative influences in terms of moving forward. But I just want to highlight one important thing that it is sometimes the... Um, the lack of warmth of an attention is not necessarily the physical act of parenting maltreatment that is a key, but sometimes it's just like the absence of proper parenting that, that is important. And sometimes this goes dismissed. So it is in that context that um, I will move to just highlighting the arsenal because we talk about Family United and why are we talking about Family United as one of the packages moving forward? Um, this is where we can see that the same family social institution is linked to several outcomes. You know, substance use, delinquency, pregnancy, dropout. These skills are, are linked to, to many things. Um, so, um, sorry, the, the slides are not reacting as fast as, as I would like to. Uh, yeah. So, but that's, I will, I will end on this slide just to highlight the fact that, you know, we're working with families when we have a spectrum of health and safe development of children, there's a big spectrum of response from promotion, health, promotion of health, a promotional health and, and prevention goes into universal selective and indicated, meaning that every family can benefit from to avoid a problem from happening uh, or families that are at high risk of a certain situation to happen, how would it uh, be affected? Indicated meaning when the symptom happens with the child, how the family can intervene in an early stage before it goes into something more um, problematic. And on treatment, there's also a spectrum. After like the child is in being uh, cared for, there's also lots of spectrum of care that the child can go through. We have programs that are designed for promoting general health messages and probably with the group that's there we can put it online listen first is one of those campaigns family united is a universal package any family can benefit from but it's designed for low income country meaning that the resources are not very hectic for the country to implement mm -hmm. families that are living in stressful circumstances uh, where, where the context of understanding your own stress as a parent, under, reading the stress in the child and how to build that relationship under stress, strong family is another one of these packages. Humanitarian settings, uh, when um, uh, in natural disaster or war situations, it's not as easy to have interactive parenting sessions, but there are simple leaflets that can be sent, booklets that can be sent. They're all for free, available in multiple languages for you and ODC. We really strongly advocate that you can go and use them and send them to family and also the context of trauma. But also within the treatment response, we work with the family on addressing drug use whenever it happens within their uh, kid, uh, within their family, within their youth, also for children affected by this, the role of the family and whenever there are 
to prevent drug overdose under the uh, SOS initiative and beyond. So the family remain a very core social institution in more than one level. Respecting the time, I will end my presentation here. But of course, I'm available for any questions and clarifications moving forward. Thank you so much, Ms. Malut. Thank you so much for showcasing and explaining what uh, the UNODC is doing also, science-based outreach for uh, supporting and strengthening families. Thank you so much. So due to time, um, we wanted to, uh, on the program, it stated that Mrs. Carolyn Henschen, our UN director of our UN offices of the Women's Federation would be here, but unfortunately she could not be here due to circumstances, but we want to acknowledge her presence online. And um, we wanted to show also a video of Women's Federation Japan, uh, which also supports uh, family skills in Peru and other countries. But I think we cannot uh, showcase that, but perhaps Miss. Henshin would uh, like to share some closing words from uh, her place in Switzerland. Okay, well, I didn't expect that, but uh, oh, it's too bad that we couldn't show that video because uh, this, um, um, this prepared video was really showed an example of the Women's Federation's work in, um, in really getting to the heart of prevention in one um, in one area in, it actually started in one area in Peru where the women were, I mean, there was a high incidence of domestic violence, of course, high poverty rates, uh, met, breakdown on all kinds of levels. COVID also uh, made it worse. And um, just the very simple idea of going in and talking with the local people to understand the situation and then to um, and then to set up small <clears throat> small programs, actually local programs, beginning in one community, with a training about again, like has been mentioned by other speakers today, how to respond to difficult circumstances in a nonviolent way, how to really, um, you know, mothers. I think one of the main points was mothers seeing their the children were. Um, you know, running away from home, domestic violence was getting worse, and they just felt they just didn't know what to do about it. And somehow through learning communication skills and developing confidence in their own ability to show the compassion and love that they felt for their children, that they feel for their children, again, somehow many, and it comes down to thousands, finally, of positive results many families could be turned around, children were coming back and rejoining their family and really communities were benefiting in huge numbers. It was really remarkable. Maybe I, I, beyond that, I would just say that um, every single program I think of our Women's Federation globally has some element of supporting family, protecting family. I myself work with the human rights in Geneva at the United Nations and from my earliest times of really looking at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I, I understood that, um, of course, it sounds amazing. And people read it and they think, yes, of course, that's what we want. That's what we need, peace culture. But how do, actually, how do you create such a sustainable situation so we don't need to create law after law and enforcement after enforcement in order to make those things possible for our world? And actually, the key is coming back to the point of the early childhood development, the respect between parents, the collaboration between families, communities, and finally institutions such as UNODC. And um, and anyway, not having more time, I would maybe just want to close a thank you to Patrick. Actually, we know each other from many years ago in California. Amazing what you're doing also. Uh, Elton Workstadt and Mr. Uh, Dr. Malouf, I'm so happy to see you again. I feel UNODC is really the leader. It, you, you, you started doing this kind of work at a time when family was not popular. And now when I look, almost all the major uh, international organizations have now departments of family or parenting. And I really attribute UNODC as being the great leader of that. And, I hope you get credit for that. So with that, I'm going to say thank you 
so much to everyone. It's, it's been an amazing session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Ms. Henshin. And thank you all for being here present in the room and also online. Thank you for all your great work uh, for contributing to healthy families and prevention. And let us keep discussing uh, throughout uh, this um, CCPCJ. And uh, herewith, I would like to close this session and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Women's Federation for World Peace is a women's organization founded in 1992. We have 120 chapters all over the world and have conducted more than 100 international cooperation projects. All our volunteers are women. From a women's perspective, we provide prompt and detailed support based on the local needs. As a women's organization, we promote women as an essential ingredient in creating a peaceful global society. As we all know, since family breakdown causes social unrest, the mother's role in creating a peace and harmony in the family is crucial for reducing crimes and leads to creating a peaceful society. Today, I would like to introduce WFWP's project in Peru started in 2007. Peruvian women are victims of violence psychologically physically, sexually, and economically. Women living in impoverished areas suffer from many serious problems, such as domestic violence, family disunity, drug abuse, child abandonment, and with pregnancies, etc. Since many housewives gather at the public kitchens every day, there was a request from the community to use this opportunity to provide education that would solve the problems housewives are facing. WFWP Japanese Overseas Volunteers for Peru took initiative in this educational activity and started giving educational lectures. The theme of lectures are based on the philosophy of WFWP. We have provided education for women to regain self-esteem, understand and respect the values and roles of men and women, and restore order in the family. Since August 2007, WFWP has now been holding 100 family centers. Over 12,000 housewives have been learning about family reconstruction education every month in Lima City, Torrijillo City, and Puno City. My 17-year-old eldest son was rebellious, and I used to shout and hit him all the time. My whole family was in a bad mood all the time, and my relationship with my husband got worse. Every day there was yelling, quarreling, accusation, and crying. And finally, my eldest son left home. I didn't know what to do with my adolescent son until I found WFWP and started attending his lectures. The lecture helped me understand how I should have behaved and what I should have done for my son. Since I started putting the lectures into practice, my relationship with my family and my son has improved. I learned to be a good mother. I listened to my son a lot and don't hit him anymore. As we started having more conversations about the importance of family and the purity of love, the entire family began to change. We talk a lot now. My son is back home and we have a great relationship. My husband and son also began attending lectures. I also got my second son. I am happy because making efforts for love gives us happiness. Many housewives who participated in the lectures said, neither the government, nor the psychologists, nor the police, nor our churches have been able to help us with our family problems. But now we are very well due to the education provided by WFWP. All the mothers and women in my neighborhood are grateful for these lectures of WFWP. Through our projects, we realize that attaining economic independence or acquisition of knowledge do not necessarily provide happiness to the beneficiaries. We need to educate people that each one of us is a precious member of our society, and we need to respect others to create sustainable, peaceful society.